Dukhi Bhuta. Good afternoon, good evening, good day, wherever you are in the world. I've heard that said a thousand times. You, sir, are uh, somewhat of, and you are the worst kind of promoter of self, but you started a journey that dials back to the early 1980s with some kind of weird fascination for a style of music that you wanted to play. And then weirdly in a small town, well, city um, of Pretoria in deepest, darkest Africa, you formed a band called The Gathering. What was the motivation? That's, that's a weird question, Jason. Um, look, I mean, you have to realize that the first album I ever bought when I was, you know, in my teens, 13 or 14, was Joy Division's Closer, which is kind of a weird one for a kid of that age. But I had neighbors that lived across the street that were like five, six years older than me. So they came out of the punk scene and, you know, took a liking to me. I don't know why. But they could see that, you know, I, I listened to different kind of music. So I, I went over and, and borrowed some of their records. And I remember it was, it was weird stuff, man. It was like Ultravox, pre your Gary Newman, you know, the Two Boy Army stuff. Um, they had The Clash. Uh, and then they started taking me to record stores with them. Because they were 18, 19, and I was like 13 or 14. Hillbrow Records, you yep. know, in the early yep. days, Jason. was still, you could still go there without worrying about being shot and shit like that. You know? <laughs> so, like, <laughs> once in those would, days. Yeah. Exactly. So, you would go. And you also have to realize at that time, with the Rand being so strong, you could buy a record for like eight, nine bucks, mm. you know? So, being 13 or 14 and having a small allowance, I could buy like two or three records a week. Yeah. You know, so I started just buying that stuff. And then I must have been like when I found Susie and the Banshees and Bauhaus. I realized, you know what? I, I like this post-punk slash goth stuff. Mm. And I always listened to it and then never, you know, started a little school band with my two best friends. And we played like really strange Cabaret Voltaire type stuff. Uh, and then went to university and then I know Oliver at that time um, was at university as well but never met him until my second year so we're talking about like 87 okay. 88 and then um, started a little band with my sister and, and one of the friends and we actually my first ever gig was um, playing with Pete Buerta no ways, really. I was talking about him today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, he's, I think my dad kind of knew him. So my dad actually asked him if, if this little band of mine could open for Jackhammer at, um, you know, that place right by the State Theater in yep, Pretoria. Yep. What was it? Yeah, what was it called? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, exactly. it, was, it was like a sailor's bar. It was very... Yeah, it was great, you know. So at that gig, because we yeah. I promoted it a little bit at university, um, Oliver was at that game. Okay. And I knew this this first band of mine wasn't going to go anywhere and whatever. What were they called? So, um, cults. K U L T Z. Yeah, it come was, on. Yeah, no, that's lazy. Just say. No, no, no. This, uh, but it was spelled with a K and it was actually out of a 2000 AD or an epic magazine. There was like a little story. That's called, not like you at all. Yes. <laughs> well, I remember at that time I was so completely nerd that I was reading comics. And you, you um, still, and, still are. and you still are. Uh, yeah, don't 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 mention that. But yeah, I still have comics from that time. <laughs> so uh, it was like a science fiction type thing, because mm. like I said, at that time, I was very into electronic music. Mm. I I didn't really play guitar or anything until I was like 18 or 19. Yeah. Um, and then Oliver and myself became friends and he had had a band at that point actually a, a really cool band called Pillar of Fate. Mm. And I remember their first gig, I, I sat in, they didn't have a drummer, so I played drums for them. <laughs> it was at my house, and we actually still have re a recording of that. 
And shortly after that, in 88, I went to England for about a month came back with a bunch of videotapes and, and new records and um, a lot of goth stuff. And I remember we sat at my house watching this stuff and I said, Oliver, you know, we could do this. <laughs> this is not hard. And I kind of like this. Mm. A month later, we had the gathering. We um, were looking for a drummer. Bunty showed up. She was playing keyboards. And we said, well, that's great, but we need a drummer. And she goes, give me two weeks. Her boyfriend, no, her boyfriend at that time was a drummer. She yeah. went, got a drum kit and learned to play drums in two weeks. She, she was just, oh. she's, a, she's a brilliant musician, right? So three months after all of this, we got our first gig through a girlfriend of mine that was our manager at that time. She just called Barney Simon up and said, hey, there's this band in Pretoria playing goth stuff. Uh, what's up? He hooked us up with the Psycho Reference. Yeah. And yeah. our first gig was um, supporting the Psycho Reptiles at one of the Joba clubs. At a time that they were, they were pretty... Just coming up, right? They yeah. were just coming up. Yeah. They were just about to release their first album. Really nice people, nice guys. I, I still um, am friends with Mike Seal. Mm. He's in, uh, I think they're all living in England. Yeah. But um, anyway, so I think after that, that they, they were going to record like a compilation album uh, in from the coal. Mm. And I think we only had like eight or nine songs and, and we were chosen for this. So within six months of forming the gathering, we were in the studio. And had no idea what we were doing. Mm. Um, I have to tell you, the In From The Cold sessions to us personally weren't that nice because, you know, we were treated as kids. Mm. I think I was only, what, 19 or 20. Oliver might have been 21. Yeah. Bunty might have been 22. My sister was still like 18. Yeah. So, yeah. But it, it worked out well. The video did well. And... Um, that's how it all started. I mean, within from start to to recording in from the cold was probably six or seven months. Yeah, there was just this this gap left in the South African industry where alternative music was only really pushed by like two or three DJs. Yeah, they didn't yeah. understand the kids that were listening to it. Mm. And I mean, we never played a gig where there weren't people. Mm. I mean, we were just lucky. Right time, right place, I think, just. Mm. And then <clears throat> the thing is that, you know, any fan of the gathering, you know, remembers, you know, Perfect Souls, remembers, you know, that's kind of the standout moment. And then it, if you look at it in, as a stamp in time, you were there, you did extraordinary things in, ex in, in an extraordinarily short period of time, and then you were gone. And I think a lot of people were left going, what happened? What, what was, you know, you were, you were, you were headed in such a good direction. Yeah. Take no, us, through, I, take I us through what happened after that. Yeah. Well, the In From The Cold album came out and it, it did really well. I mean, we're talking about, what was that? 88. Um, and I know Barney, Simon, Neil Johnson, those guys all played it on the radio and it was doing well. Hmm. And we were playing really good gigs. And then um, I think the Flying Circus album where we did Lamb Stricken came out. Yeah. We did a short tour, you know, all the, the major things. And then um, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I mean, we, we did sign short term record deals, like for one offs. Yeah. You know, yeah. with certain companies. Then I think, and, and to tell you the truth, you have to realize at that point, myself and Oliver and Bunty and my sister were all full-time students. I mean, I was working on my archaeology degree. Ollie was, I think he was in law at that time and then changed over to computers. Mm -hmm. Bunty was doing something. My sister just started. So the gathering, although it was like really important to us, 
we still had to get through university, which I finished in 89, just before the outsiders. Yeah. Oliver never stopped. He, he finished. Um, Bunty never stopped. We recorded one single after Flying Circus independently, mm. which was, um, it's like a limited edition single, um, which will obviously be re-released. And then, you know, it was just a question of, we were in our teens and early 20s, mm. Jason, and the South African record industry at that time, you have to realize, um, and I don't know if it's still like that, was run by you know, baby boomers that had no fucking idea what we were doing. Yeah, or okay. understood it, yeah. Like, like, they had no idea. I mean, their idea of a great band was, you know, Little Sister, yeah. which we, we as girls, and, and I, I liked them. They were very nice people, but 90% of their repertoire was um, cover versions. Yeah. And, and you know, they, they had one or two, like, nice hits like pop hits hmm. so that and at that point what mango groove was like a big yeah. thing at that point yeah um and we played some festivals where you know we were on there as well now can you imagine um you have the <laughs> gathering playing before mango groove or you know no friends yeah. have playing before uh, the tank. i mean it was just such a hodgepodge of like there was no direction where the record companies went like in England, what they did that independence yes. where they actually put these bands on a bill together. Yes. Now, yes. you know, don't know what Barney's doing at the moment. At that point, he was trying to do that yes. by getting all these bands to at least play at the same festival and whatever. Yeah. And, and give him props for that. You mm. know, that's, that was a good idea. But I don't think he had the, the full backing of the people with money at the record companies. Oh, no, definitely not. Which we found out later when, <laughs> you know, the outsiders <laughs> signed to another record company and got totally fucked there. But um, <laughs> that's, but, that's part two of this conversation and, and yeah, yeah. a much more I mean, animated one. Um, no, I, I know. And, and, you know, the outsiders first record company, Inosh Records, was a independent. Yeah, and really to this day, I, I almost think that it would have been better for us to stay to have stayed with that. Yeah. But you know, ambition, and and unfortunately, in when I got older and, and re realized that this could make money, and the band could get more popular, mm. I made that mistake of going from a small independent to a larger independent. Yeah, who didn't really have our uh, our best interest in mind. No, no, and I think. Both of the labels, bless their cotton socks, certainly the former was more informed, but the latter, you know, just didn't care. But we'll save that <clears throat> for next time. But um, so you have this journey, you have this experience with this band, you, you've you tasted a level of success, yes, independently and kind of very fringe niche, call it what you will. Um, so so you, you if, if there had been a bug, the bug had bitten. Um, so you dissolve yeah. the gathering with a body of work that now finally you you well in the last couple of years you've been working on and literally dusting off uh, recordings that in some cases have never been heard commercially um, almost because you know based on the fact that there as you say you never played to an empty room there were always people there. And the music was was fundamentally worthy of of you know of of the accolades that it enjoyed. So now we start this journey of compiling and presenting what never happened back in the day. There was never a finished record, um, mm -hmm. and you know, fast track. You do the maths. Uh, <laughs> God, it's probably is you know going on. 40, no, 40 years yeah 40 years later <clears throat> um you've you you know you've you've had the opportunity to work with some uh some serious legacy people with remastering and well rather remixing some of those original tracks just to get them up to speed but the i know what the motivation is but what is from your 
perspective other than wanting to own the complete works of the gathering uh, of putting this basically debut album 40 years later <laughs> yeah um well like you said i mean for me jason you started off the conversation i've never been a, a great self-promoter um i always believe that you when you that. Release, let's just put that out well no i i do and and the thing is it's it's just it's it's not about me it's it's about the people that i work with and the combination of people Absolutely. when you i've only ever been in three bands in my whole yeah. life right the gathering was one the outsiders was one and i had a band here in in america like 10 15 years ago where we released two albums um uh, can, I I wanted... you, can i correct you there was a yeah. fourth well, I'm talking about bands that played live, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, fucking about around. The joy. Hey, come on, you can't forget. No, about no, I, I know, but we never played live and it was uh, an outsider's thing. That I'm joking. And I can put another one in there. I mean, um, I actually had a little um, band in the early 2000s before Vent that was myself, two guys here, and Les Warner from The Cult played drums yeah. for us and we actually played a couple of gigs Les is an, an awesome drummer i mean i've i've played with with some people here in the, in the states that that you know it's, it's not bad but again because it never went anywhere i'm not gonna talk about that shit it doesn't matter i mean i'm i'm sure people have played with or jammed with people that are way more famous than the people i've yeah, played but, but it is part of your story it is part of your yeah, it's story. part of my story but it's 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 not something that you yeah, know but it, I but but it has informed where we are. Yeah, no, I, I know. You know but I mean? I mean the three the three bands that that I I put some serious work into were were those three. I mean the gathering we were together for less than two years from start to finish. Um, I'm sure there are more songs that we recorded than the six or seven will release. Um, the release for me is purely just to almost end a chapter in my life that was left open because I, I've always loved goth music. I mean, it's, it's one of my favorite genres. I think it's like the post-punk era, probably a very important part of music history, which people are now starting to realize, you know, you look at what's going into the rock and roll hall of fame, which is a big wank, mm. just like the, the Oscars and whatever. But they're starting to realize that, you know, bands like Depeche Mode, bands like Duran Duran, uh, Talking Heads went in earlier, Clash obviously went in yeah. early. Those bands changed music. Yeah. It wasn't the wank bands of, you know, the, the glam metal of the, the late yeah. 80s. It was yeah. what happened after that and before that. So, um, so I think once, once The Cure went into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, all bets were off. <laughs> that is true. I mean, that guy's been making music for 50 years that's as good as anything that's ever been made. Yeah. So, um, so, so would you say that the, gathering, the Gathering's demise was premature? That it oh, could, have, could have? Yeah. I, I think if The Gathering had uh, some sort of support or we were a bit older, like if we had a manager, if we had a, a record company like a Sun Bazaar or a Factory or a Mute. If you had a strategy. Go, mm. Yeah. Listen, these guys are actually talented. What we need to do with them is give them two or three albums to develop. Yeah. Can you imagine right. if the Sex Pistols didn't have Malcolm McLaren? Can you imagine if Led Zeppelin didn't have Peter Green? Or yeah. was it Peter something, right? I mean, whoever they're... The manager, the manager was mm. these guys would have not been what they are now yeah. you you need uh, even you too i mean a band that's had the same manager for what 50 years yeah you know and and these are not i'm not saying these are the best bands in the world but i'm saying these bands are together because they had stability and they had strategy they had, mm. yeah they had they had a guy that was a bit older with with some sort of knowledge of the record industry Mm. You have to realize we were, like I said, late teens, early 20s, yeah. and everyone was just like, 
yeah, you guys are good. Let's give you this one song and whatever. And then we have to go back to university. And there, there was at that point in South Africa, there was no structure. Yeah, this still is was a thing. There was no money to put in these bands because, well, we're not just going to sell. And look what happened after the outsiders left. 94, 95, all of a sudden you had this massive influx of really good bands that were supported by the record industry. Yeah. Springbok, yeah. Girls, Fetish, all those bands that when I came back to visit in 2000, I could not believe even Ashton Knight's um, goth stuff. Mm. He actually had some support from record companies yeah now can yeah. you imagine if we had had that when no friends were around psycho reptiles the gathering all those bands if we had just had the support i'm sure the gathering would have released two or three albums but i do you know? think yeah but i do think that what the gathering did was so foundational that bands like that you cite whether it's the nude girls or whether it was fetish <clears throat> or even Ashton Knight, um, who came a bit later, if you hadn't done the heavy lifting that you had done as The Gathering, um, those bands would not have had the level of investment that was made. Because, yes, you did the heavy lifting, you got people interested, and then obviously then you exited stage left, um, and yeah. you, left, you left that space open, and it was then suddenly filled. But sadly... You know, we, we sit in a situation now where that hasn't that hasn't been paid forward, as it as it were. Um, no, I, I I get it, and and unfortunately, like I said, the the guys from No Friends of Harry were about four or five years older than us. So were the Psycho Reptiles, and they definitely had a better strategy than we had. Like yeah. I said, we were four kids from Pretoria. Yeah. I mean, what's Pretoria known for? Absolutely nothing at that point. You know, I mean, I can understand, you know, people would go to bars and, you know, Pete's band, Jack Hammer and bands like that, you know, the blues based bands, mm -hmm. they, they would do better because it would be old people going to watch them get drunk in a bar and want them to play, you know. And yet, and yet, if you fucking about Clearwater it. revival <laughs> covers, yeah. you know. Yeah, but, but. Pretoria, by comparison to Johannesburg at the time of the gathering, the only place, and we, we experienced this as the outsiders, was that the only place where you could get a gig playing original music was in this highly, highly, highly conservative city called Pretoria, where you would expect the opposite to be true. Mm -hmm. So weirdly, you know, um, Pretoria was this, I don't know, mini Seattle. It was this mini, you know, unexpected. It was the unknown. It yeah. was the un absolutely the only way we could get gigs where we could play. I remember, and this was not so much with the gathering because we didn't play that many gigs, but especially with the outsiders, we had to go. Remember Cherries too, yep. and all those places. We had to go to bars or little restaurants and convince the owner mm. to give us a night yeah. where we would bring in the PA and give us a month. Of Wednesdays. Mm. Mm. Now, who the fuck goes out on a Wednesday in Pretoria? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the sidewalks roll up at eight o'clock. Exactly. Know? But we would have to convince this guy to give us a month, and by the end of that month, we packed the place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we always did. Yeah. Because Every there venue. were kids, there, you know, there yeah. were kids there that were sick and tired of hearing, you know, Alex J in the morning playing a bunch of bullshit that was on the top twenty. Yeah, they would listen Dan. to the time for three, four hours. No, but you know what I mean? Yeah. They played the same shit on yeah. the radio over and over. Yeah. I remember the first time they played The Outsiders on the radio was, it was like 12, 1 in the morning on mm. one of these shows on Radio 5. And afterwards, the guy said, well, that sounds okay, but I don't know what that is. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. What does but, that mean? What does yeah. that even mean? Yeah. Yeah, sakes, and that and that was always the issue. It was a case of yeah, because they couldn't they couldn't define you because you weren't from there where that was made, and now you've you know you've reinterpreted it in a South African reality. That was the problem is that they couldn't identify with you, and sadly, those people were the ones making the decisions that were going to get exactly. you played and get you booked exactly. for a gig. Yeah, but so so it it, it was it was just at that point 
I think myself and Oliver realized, and you know, when, when you're that age as well, you don't have a lot of patience, you know, yeah. you want things to happen quickly. And um, I'm still friends with Oliver. I don't know where Bunty is. I, <laughs> I have no idea where she is. She's but drummers, today. well, drummers seem to disappear all over the place. It took uh, yeah. 10 years to find there them. And, and this and is a theme that we'll pick up on in our next session. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I mean, I, I, I'm, I, obviously my sister is my sister. But it's, it's, I, it's something that there was left unfinished. And I think with this, coming back to your question, long-winded, to, to finish the gathering, it would be to just take the stuff that we did yeah. and put it on a piece of vinyl. Yeah. Even if it sells 10 copies, Jason, I don't really give a shit, hmm. right? I'm yeah. too old at this point to worry about making money off music because at this point, good luck to any band that's going to try right now, mm -hmm. right? Um, just to give never you an idea, when, for instance. Never mind when you were making the music that, that we're exactly, about to release. Really exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's, there's no ways. I mean, I feel sorry for bands that start now. You're going to have to slog it out on the road and hopefully, you know, support Britney Spears or whoever, Miley Cyrus or whatever. And, and not, not to say that they're bad. I'm just saying you're going to have to sell out in order to make money. Yeah. At that point, we weren't willing to sell out. No, we never, were, ever. never, ever. And, and I think the other problem that we had was the record industry looked at us as a bunch of little punk kids. Yeah. And there was just no respect given to us. So we just thought, you know what? Here's your middle finger. We're not going to give you any respect. Yeah. And that kind of shot us in the foot at, at that point. But you know what? I just feel that it's important to release this and if we have five fans left and they get that album and they're happy, that makes me happy. Yeah, result, result. It's, it's just, you, you influence one person in your life positively is better than influencing 10 million negative. Exactly. exactly. And that's just how I've always thought, you know, and yeah. that's how I raise my kids as well. You know, as yeah, long awesome. as they're good kids, I don't care what they become. No, awesome. I thank you, sir. Um, we look forward to the release, um, hopefully within uh, the coming months, so watch the space. Um, I'm excited for you. I think it's, a, as you say, it's a, it's, a, it's a cathartic journey that you're on at the moment. And I think it's one that um, even just selfishly will reward so many of the people who were there that actually enjoyed it at the time. But also, I think, tease in a curious audience as you were walking through the streets of Bromfontein and Hillbrow. Um, and that's kind of, that's the fun part. That's the unknown because that's the joy of music. And the, the, the work that you created was authentic. It was heartfelt and it came with no agenda. And that's the joy of being able to package it, as you say, and um, close a particular chapter and then move on to the next, which we'll cover in our next yeah. session. But thank you so one, much. One thing, one thing I would just like to say as well is obviously, thank you to Oliver, my sister, Bunty, and then Charles Kruger, who was our, our main guy that helped us. He was I mean, the our band member. <laughs> without Charles, Charles like definitely the fifth member of the band and helping us live at Thunderdome, you know, throwing feathers and balloons from the, the top there and, <laughs> and running the cameras and all that stuff. It was fun, Jason. That mm. was the main thing for me with the gathering. Yeah. It was fun and exciting. And I think if more people take music like that, you'll see the end result will always be will always be good, even if it's not good to other people. It's it was honest. a great time in my life. Yeah, but it's know? honest. It's honest, right? Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you.